many people faint and are weary in marriage because they didn't build the stamina when they were single. Your single years are not the years you used to wait to get married. That's not the purpose of it. They are the years you used to prepare for life. Hallelujah. Most kingdom shakers and even secular people that have made impact in this life, you will find out most of them found their purpose when they were single. Most of them found their path when they were single. Most of them built stamina when they were single. You can't compare the amount of hours, for instance, you have to prepare for school, to prepare for uh, ministry, to prepare for anything that you will have when you are single compared to when you are married. Ask anybody that has gone to school when they are married. <laughs> compare it to when you are single and all you have to do is your books. When you are married and you are in school, your husband has to still eat. Just because you have exams tomorrow doesn't suspend the hunger. Of your family, everybody still has to eat. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? If you're a man, when you are single, you, you don't even need to rent a house, you can squat with someone while you're writing your exams. But you have a family. Just because you have exams doesn't mean the rent, they will suspend your rent. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So the single years is a gift. It's a gift. Stop crying and complaining and fighting God. That why am I still single at this age? The question should be, what should I be doing with this season of my life that will affect the next season of my life? Is somebody getting what I'm saying? A lot of single people have high expectation but low preparation. High expectations but what? Low preparation. Low preparation. They are just say, oh, I need to marry. You know, once I, once I, the reason why I'm not happy, I'm, the reason why I'm depressed is because I've not found the bone of my bone or the flesh of my flesh. If I just find, if I find the right person, I'll be happy. I tell people that's not true. It is when you are happy that you will find the right person. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Most singles think in their head that when I find the right person, I'll be happy. No, it's when you are happy that you will find the right person. You are more likely to attract the right person when you are happy than when you are depressed. When you are depressed and sad and looking for the right person, even the right person will be avoiding you. <laughs> because this world is so hard, nobody wants to join to another sad person. Everybody is looking for somebody joyful, successful, promising. That's what everybody is looking for. So you should find your joy and happiness now. And whoever enters your life is going to partake of your happiness, not bring happiness into your life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Find your happiness first. Whoever enters your life is coming to partake. And your happiness and joy and fulfillment makes you more attractive. Everybody knows a good thing when they see it. But when you're looking morose, looking depressed, looking sad, looking dejected, looking rejected, and so you're looking for the right person, everybody's avoiding you. Find your happiness. It's easier to be happy when you are single than when you are married. Most people don't know. It's easier to be happy when you are what? Single. Because when you are single, you can do anything you want. You are the alpha <laughs> and the omega of your happiness. You are the author and the finisher of your own faith. Because you can choose what you are going to eat this afternoon. You don't have to consult anybody. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? No consultations necessary. You can even decide not to eat at all. Because you are your own government. You are the senate, you are the parliament, you are the government. All by yourself. So you pass the bill that we are not eating till night. And it's approved by senate presidents, approved by the presidency. <laughs> is somebody getting what I'm saying you can just say in fact we are traveling this weekend and you pass the bill and the funds are released no consultation no need to consult the central bank the funds are released immediately you can borrow on behalf of your government 
<laughs> you can borrow. You can buy official cars as much as you want. No parliament to, to consult. But once you get married, <laughs> you have to prepare your speech. <laughs> prepare the budget with your strong reasons to persuade the powers that be to sign those signatures. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? It's easier to find your happiness when you are single. I tell people, the first thing I do when I enter a room is to put off the air conditioning. That's the first thing I do. My wife is the opposite. The first thing she does when she enters the room is to put on the air conditioning. So you see, it's more difficult to get my, what I want when I'm married. I have to consider another person. And most times, opposites attract. I told you that yesterday. Talkers and talkers don't find themselves attractive. So talkers are usually attracted to listeners. Listeners are attracted to talkers. Spenders are attracted to savers. Savers are attracted to spenders. That's how it works. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, is, so you, usually the way relationship goes, opposites first attract, then they frustrate. That's what it is where many people either leave the relationship or leave the marriage. Because the same opposite that made each other attractive now begin to frustrate each other. Why do you always want the air conditioning cold? Why do you always want it warm? This place is too warm. This place is too cold. And serious argument can come out of it. <laughs> My wife likes her food cold. She can eat from the fridge. <laughs> Me, I like to be seeing steam on my food. I might need to see the steam. <laughs> my wife is a saver. I'm the spender, but I've repented now. <laughs> but I used to be the spender. Heavy spender. I make money. I have grace to make money. Money is not my problem. I will make money any day. It's just that I spend more than I make. <laughs> I spend at a faster rate. And you know, most of you don't know your financial habits when you're single. Is, you know, when you're, like I said, when you're single, you are the government. You are overspending, but nobody's complaining because everybody's you. The, uh, is the, everybody's you. You are the one eating the overspending. So everybody's happy with the government, even though we are owing. <laughs> but the day another person joins into your life, all your own habits that are negative will start to show. When I was alone, yeah, I was living that way and it was fine. But when I got married, another human being was involved. So my overspending became a problem. And maybe when she shares in the evening, she will share how she overcame that. <laughs> but those small things can break a home. My wife is a saver. I don't know how she does it. You know, and <laughs> no matter how much money, you know, we need or have, somewhere along the line, I've finished spending everything I have, and I'll say, well, I need... Um, Maybe 100,000 or 200,000, and she will say, I have it. I'll be like, You have money in this house. <laughs> There's money in this house. <laughs> so nowadays, I tell everybody that, Look, I tell my country, don't even borrow from China again, just go and borrow from my wife. <laughs> because she always has money. <laughs> she always has money. No matter what's going on, no matter how much cash is in the world, if there's one person I can bet that has money somewhere, it's my wife. Because she's just a saver. <laughs> She's an amazing saver. Savers don't buy anything. They price everything they don't buy. You know, you know savers? They say, how much is this shoe? You say, it's 2,000. You say, hmm. It's too much. They price they don't buy. They are savers. They like to save. Spenders, we go to the same place. How much is this shoe? 2,000. I say, give me three. I will deposit the first 2,000. I'll be paying the other one. Small, small. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, it's more difficult to find happiness when there's another person to consult. If you're not happy now that you're single, I can guarantee you you're not going to be happy in marriage. You need to bring your own happiness when you're coming into the marriage. It's easier to find happiness when you are single than to do it when you are having to consult with another person all the time. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Don't put the burden of happiness, of your happiness, on another human being. That's too much weight. Only God is responsible for that. It's only God that can meet all your need. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Find your happiness. Find your happiness. Second thing you need to find, find your healing. Find your what? Healing. 
many problems people face in marriage, Dr. Kwame, many problems people face in marriage is not a marital problem. It's an individual problem that somebody brought into marriage. I guess what I'm saying? There is no marriage problem. It's individual problems that was brought. If you have anger, it's not a marriage problem. It's an individual problem. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Marriage itself is not angry. You had anger problems you did not manage when you were single. Moses, what stopped Moses from entering the promised land? He had anger issues. The anger didn't start when God called him. It started even before God called him. And I'm sure maybe because he couldn't grow with his parents, his father left him because of circumstances. He grew as an adopted son in the palace. Maybe he was maltreated, I don't know. But he had anger problems. He saw an Egyptian flogging and uh, dealing with an Israelite. Nobody was there. He beat the guy and killed him with his bare hands probably. That's how angry he was. So, by the way, some people kill cockroaches. You should know that you should not marry this guy. Cockroach just passes. Can you enter my house? The thing is there, the steamer is woo, anger. The way he kills the mosquito, he squeezes his hand. Say, woo. There's anger. <laughs> is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, so it was easy for Satan to still trip Moses through the same anger. Because it wasn't a marriage problem. It was an individual problem that was brought into marriage. Find your healing. Which areas do you need healing? I always say, is your normal normal? What you call normal, is it really normal? Is your normal normal? The way you talk, is it normal? You know, some people naturally just talk condescendingly to other people. Some people talk with pride. Some are just very forward. Some are just lazy. Most marital problems are individual problems that existed before the marriage. That's why some of those problems, marriage counseling can't solve it because it was never a marriage problem. It's an individual problem that needs to be solved. Find your healing. I have a book here titled Heal Before You Deal. Heal Before You Deal. There are many of you, you don't know areas you have insecurities now. You know some people, if you don't call them all their title, they'll be upset. You must complete the full title plus all, everything they have. Because it's their source of identity. They are struggling with their identity. If they can't call you just your name and you're happy, something is wrong with you. Because all your titles are things you acquired here. You are, you are, you are first a person before your title. And the thing about some of your titles is that one day it will not be your title. So you must be happy with your name. Many years ago, I had a friend that was angry with me over something. I know what he said. He said, I won't call you pastor anymore. I said, I don't care. You see, if I was somebody that was very jealous about my title, I'm a pastor. <laughs> that threat could have broken my heart. You see, you need to understand. You need a, you need a healthy self-esteem. You need a healthy what? Self-esteem. I'm writing a self-esteem Bible from New Testament, from Jesus had incredible self-esteem. Incredible. People, he just preached a message, people left, and he asked the remaining people, won't you leave? <laughs> Who does that? No pastor likes that. If two members leave your church, you're even upset. He came back and asked the remaining, that you two, are you not going to leave? Because his identity was not based on the attendance. Not based on it. His success in ministry is not tied to how many people are in the service. Incredible self-esteem. Satan said, if you be the son of God, turn stone to bread. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Jesus would have said, how many loaves do you need? <laughs> if you wanted to prove a point. But he said, no. 
I am not, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not proven by the amount of bread I can make from stone. Um, I am who I am because I am who God says I am. That's all that matters. He said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. If God says I'm a son of God, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what you think. Because human beings can change their mind. The same people that shouted Hosanna yesterday can shout crucify him today. You can't depend on them. They are fickle. Same person say I love you with all my heart today can say I hate you with all my heart tomorrow. Your identity can't be built on that. This is why I see people that when somebody breaks, somebody says he's not marrying you anymore, you want to go and commit suicide. Instead of committing murder, you want to commit suicide. <laughs> you want to kill yourself. Why do you want to kill yourself? <laughs> kill the person. Okay, don't kill anybody, please. <laughs> I'm joking, don't kill anybody, please. <laughs> I don't know if you get what I'm saying. You want to commit suicide because he's not marrying you anymore. That means you didn't know who you were before they came. You need to hell this self esteem. The same Jesus turned, when he there to feed people, he multiplied bread. So the multiplying bread wasn't a problem for him. It's just that he wouldn't do it just to prove a point to you. He had incredible self-esteem. They told him that other people are baptizing people. If he's an African minister, you told that they've started a church down the road. They are preaching the kind, same kind of thing. Hey! You say, make sure our members don't go there. He said, no. He said, no. If they're not against us, they're for us. Let them go ahead and baptize other people. Hallelujah. Let them go ahead and baptize other people. Jesus has incredible self-esteem. The same Jesus came to John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to tie your less. Jesus says, suffer it to be so for now. Still baptize me because no matter how, who I am, I still need to be submitted to authority. There are many people here that nobody can talk to them. I'm the head of my home. No matter who you are, you too need to be submitted to authority. There must be someone in this life that can tell you the truth without being afraid of, of, to, of to offend you. Are you here, somebody? You know there are some people that want you to give them advice contrary to what they want to hear. They move to another place. You are no more their mentor. All your advice must agree with what they want. Are you here, somebody? Heal before you deal. It's a blue book. You'll see it out there. Please get it. There are many of your behaviors now that you need to detect that are, they are, they are toxic. They are toxic. It's called heal before you deal. They are toxic behavior. You know there are some women that can never like a guy that comes to them. So there's women like that. If a man wants them, they can't like that man. They, they, they want to be the one that will chase a man. I, I'm, I'm telling you. They must chase the man. They don't like men that come to them. They keep, and they keep chasing men, and these men keep deceiving them. But they will still chase more. As a woman, you are not designed to hunt. That's not your design. You are designed to attract. So I tell women, you don't choose who you want. You choose from amongst who wants you. <laughs> Is somebody getting this? Mm. Or else you, you, it will put you in trouble. Because you are chasing men all over the place. Heal before you deal. Don't say, if I don't marry by the end of the year, I will die. I'll kill myself. You need healing. And if you don't deal with your baggages now, whoever you marry, you will just punish the person. Because you're going to carry all your baggages to their house. Heal before you deal. Very important. So I've said, find your happiness. I've said, find your what? Healing. If you are going to Enjoy marriage. From your single years, you prepare for life. Not just for marriage. You prepare for life. There are seven areas. I'm just compressing this message as much as I can. There are seven areas every human being needs to prepare. Not just singles, but every human being. Seven areas you must prepare if you're going to live a fulfilling life. Remember, your single years is where you prepare for life. Marriage is not everything. It's not everybody that will get married. Marriage is important and powerful, but please don't, don't make it a do or die issue. It's not heaven. The only thing that you must make is heaven. There are many people that their purposes will not even permit them to marry. Everywhere is quiet. <laughs> let me drink water. And let that sink in. <laughs> Do 
Some people's purposes will not allow them to marry. John the Baptist could not marry. Jesus could not marry. Who would Jesus have married? <laughs> and you tell your wife that I'm going to die this weekend. <laughs> that woman won't allow you to go out that day. Am I correct? <laughs> Who will you leave these children for? You are not going to die in Jesus' name. <laughs> you shall not die but live in the name of Jesus. He won't allow you to die in peace. There's no way his purpose would have allowed him to marry. Are you here, somebody? Paul the apostle could not have married. Made no sense. If you see the kind of lifestyle he lived, no woman will allow you to do that. They stone you and leave you for dead and you wake up and continue preaching. That will be your last day <laughs> of ministry. <laughs> is somebody getting what I'm saying? Marriage is not heaven. It's not a do or die. Hmm. There are seven areas you must prepare because preparation is important. Marriage is like a long distance race. In Nigeria, we see all Kenyans as long distance runners. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. It's true, right? Because <laughs> we just think that's what all of you do. All of you just run long distance. Like if you're going to Tanzania, you don't take a plane, you just run <laughs> to the next country. <laughs> That's what we think. We think all of you run. I was surprised when I saw cars in Kenya. <laughs> Thought everybody just run to anywhere they want to go. <laughs> Praise God. So, when I was in secondary school, we were doing uh, a, a, a competition that involved other secondary schools. And um, I was not born again then. And all my friends were going. And they were all discussing how it was going to be fun. They were going to see fine girls. They were going to do bad things. I was not born again then. And I said, ah, I'm the only bad guy in the school not going. And I said, what, what sports can I do? The football, the soccer, they were already complete. The volleyball, they were complete. All the sports had already take, was taken. The only place there was vacancy. Not really vacancy, but that, that you could still compete was long distance race. <laughs> only three guys represented our school in long distance. Nobody competes with them. Because long distance is not something everybody can do in our own country. In your own country, I know that will be everybody who just everybody will persuade. But in our own, only three people were representing the school, and nobody used to challenge them. These three people were the only three people that go every time. Nobody challenged them. I said, I will challenge them. <laughs> what do they mean? Because I must go with my bad friends. My motive was even wrong from the beginning. There are many of you here. The reason why you want to marry is even wrong. This is why. You know, like I said yesterday, I have a book here, 25 Wrong Reasons People Enter Relationships. If you enter for the wrong reason, you have most likely entered with the wrong person. If your motive is wrong, the person too you will choose will be wrong. If you are single here, please get that book. It will help you censor your motive. Because you are praying desperately, oh God, I want to marry. Let that censor your motive. Why do you want to marry? I'm lonely. I'm lonely. <laughs> you need Netflix, not husband. Download Netflix and subscribe for it. That's what you need. Loneliness is not the absence of affection. It's the absence of direction. You need to find purpose, not a husband. Are you here, somebody? Because even when you marry that man, you will still be lonely. If you are lonely when you are single, you will be lonely and married. There's only one thing worse than being single and lonely. It is being married and lonely. Are you here, somebody? Only one thing is worse than being single and lonely. And that is being what? Married and lonely. Single people don't know that there are many married people that are more lonely than you. I'm telling you. There are many married people that are lonelier because there's somebody physically with them, but he's not emotionally with them. Oh, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. I see that in couples. I can tell couples that are close if I'm with them for five minutes. You will see some people are not involved. They are physically sitting together, but you can sense the emotional distance. That's why Jesus Christ said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There are two different things. Leave you is physical, forsake you is emotional. Some people have not left you physically, but they are forsaking you. <laughs> ah. I teach ladies that nobody breaks up with you at the spur of the moment. Nobody breaks up with you at the spur. Any time a man or a woman breaks up with you, it wasn't that day they decided. They have left you emotionally long ago. They have thought about it, they have planned their exit, everything has been settled. Where they are going next has been arranged. They're just looking for opportunity to tell you. So one day you just come and step on them. They'll say, you step on me. It's over. 
<laughs> it's over between us. And you will think, ah, this is just step is a mistake. Please forgive me. You are begging. See, don't ever beg somebody that breaks up with you. Because that's not the day they broke up with you. They've broken up with you since. They've forsaken you in their heart long ago. They are looking for how to live physically. So if you are begging them, you are wasting your time. You are disgracing yourself. The small dignity you have left, keep it intact. <laughs> Don't beg anyone that is breaking up with you in a relationship. Say, step on me. It's over. Don't beg them. Say, thank you for being honest with me. Don't cry there. If you cry there, it will add to their story because their friends are already waiting to hear how it went. He has already told them he's going to tell you this week. So they are following up. Have you told her? Have you told her? What did she do? So if you add crying to it, they will put you, it will add to the Netflix movie. Don't cry. Hold your dignity together. Say thank you. Give him my charger. In your house. <laughs> Collect all your property. Give him my charger. My laptop. Give me everything that I have here. Collect it with dignity. Carry yourself to your friend's house. Then sit on the floor, remove your wig and cry there. <laughs> but don't beg him and don't cry there. Are you getting what I'm saying? So please, get the book 25 Wrong Reasons. People enter relationship. Don't enter for the wrong reason. Also, please get healed before you deal. Very important. It will help you. You must come healed. So how do you prepare? So I said long distance race. So um, I was going to challenge those four guys. Now, those three guys. So those three guys, normally they wake up early in the morning before classes. They go to the field and they run around 1,500 uh, meters. They run around the field, time themselves, practice. Me, I wake up 10 o'clock. <laughs> and when I first woke up, first thing I do is to smoke cigarettes. I was a second guy. I told I was a bad guy yesterday now. And I had those bad friends. So we wake up 10 a.m. People have gone to class. We wake up late. First thing we do is go downstairs behind the dormitory and go and smoke different things. <laughs> then when we come back, so my friends, that's okay. you have a race so in a few weeks. How are we going to prepare? 1,005. We don't go to the field. We stay in the dormitory. And we measure the dormitory from here to here. How many times do we need to run inside the dormitory to make it 1,500 meters? You see, you can't successfully fail without foolish friends. When God wants to bless you, he brings good people into your life. When Satan wants to deceive you, he also brings useless people into your life. You can't successfully fail without bad friends. So they help me to measure the dormitory. How many times do I need to run back and forth? You see, the way you're laughing, that's how some people, that's how you're preparing for marriage. The way you're preparing for marriage, there's no, there's no way you will succeed because your preparation is already wrong. So they measure it. Then I start running, then they time me in the dormitory, touching wall. That's how I was preparing for long distance race. The day of the race came. Four of us. These three guys, nobody challenged us. I was the fourth man in the fire. Four of us. And I was very popular in school. My name is Kingsley, so I had a nickname, King Zo. That's when I knew in life, Dr. Kwame, that it doesn't matter how many people are supporting you. If you are not prepared, you will still fail. I don't care how many people come for your wedding and how many people are clapping for you and pouring flowers on you. If you are not prepared for that marriage, you will still fail. They were all shouting, King Zo, King Zo, King Zo, King Zo. Support us. Everybody supported me. On your marks. Set. Go. What were my fans shouting? They were shouting. Supporters, faithful supporters. But no preparation. I took off. My plan was to follow the guy that comes first so that I will come second. You will know a failure by his goals. He's not planning to win. You're not planning to have a great marriage. Just want a man. It mustn't be peaceful. You just, I just have only the man. One lady told me that I know that men, all men cheat. That my husband will be cheated. As long as he comes back home to me, I'm okay. Weak goals. There are people that are setting such funny goals. I know we'll beat each other. In every marriage, there must be beating. We'll beat each other, but we'll, we'll still make up. I said, go and buy first aid box. <laughs> there are many people that are entering marriage with this kind of low goals. So we took off. Keizo, keizo. First lap, I was coming second as I planned. Following the guy that comes first. Second lap, I was still second. And my people were shouting what? Ah, uh, It's only here I have fans, so I don't have fans up there. <laughs> you people are never supporting me. I've never failed yet. I've never supported. 
Okay, I have two fans there. Thank you. Uh -huh. But you didn't shout when I was saying you should shout. <laughs> so, they were shouting, King, so, King, so. I was coming second. I didn't know that in long distance race, that the first few laps, they are saving their energy. You see, you are Kenyans. You know that. I didn't know that. All of you know that. I didn't know that the last lap, everybody's going to increase their pace. I thought this pace we were going is our best because now I was surviving by my best. This was all I had. By the third final lap, they blew the whistle, boop, and those three guys increased their pace. Ah. I wanted to follow them, but my spirit said, if you try it, you will die. You know when your heart says you can't take it? It couldn't move. I wanted to go, no, but it couldn't move. They all took off, Foo, increased their speed. I wanted to go, no energy. The only thing that saved me was that at the turn where they were going to start increasing, there was bush. So as they made the turn, me, I just ran straight into the bush. I ran straight into the bush. I went to sit down there. You can't kill me for my mother. <laughs> it is cool I came not to win the Olympics. I ran inside and went to sit down in the bush. Until they finished everything, everybody left. Only my useless friends that measured dormitory with me, they waited for me to come out. And they asked me what happened. Which one is what happened? Are we not the one that did the nonsense measurement we were doing in dormitory? Instead of coming to field to practice, like everyone else. Are you here, somebody? <laughs> Find the success habits. Find your habits. Find your what? The habits. The habits that make for success. So find your happiness, find your healing, find the habits. Preparation is a major habit of success. Somebody didn't prepare for exam and is shocked that he doesn't know the question. Of course you will know the question. The question are for people that have what? Prepared. Find your habit. Find the habits of success. Successful people don't succeed by accident. There is nothing like luck. I wish we could tell Africa there's nothing like luck. Africans believe in luck so much. They think the Western world are lucky. And we were unlucky. Well, if you check in natural resources, we have more natural resources. They have habits that make them successful. Find the habits that prepare you for marriage. What are the habits? One of the major habits you must have is habit of service. Come on, everybody say service. All marriage is, is two people serving themselves. Not two people loving themselves. Oh my God. Marriage is not two people loving themselves. It's two people what? Serving themselves. I have a book here titled Common Love Lies That Can Stop You From Finding True Love. Please, everybody, get ready. I sing mind. Get it. We, we have been told so many lies, Reverend Kwame. So many lies about love. That's what's making people not to find true love. Because they, they, they don't have the real idea of what love is. We have watched too many cartoons, too many movies. I have told you that these people doing movies are not interested in your life. They are not teaching you any values. They are just trying to sell movies and sell diamond rings and sell flowers and sell chocolate. They have nothing to do with teaching you real life values. Love is not a major component for marriage to survive. It's important but it's not one of the most vital. There are common love lies you have been told. Marry who you love. So everybody's looking for one fantasy love. One person that we see and butterfly will be in my stomach. Butterflies have short lifespan. Real love or real marriage is two people serving themselves. Not a feeling. I've seen people say, oh, from the first day I saw you, I knew you were the one. I loved you at first sight. You can't love somebody at first sight. You can be attracted to somebody at first sight. So you must define it well. Calling it love deceives your brain. Say, oh, from the first day I saw you, I loved you. That's not true. And women like to hear those nonsense. From the first day I saw you, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nobody can love you at first sight. They can be attracted to you at first sight. They can admire you at first sight. But they can't love you at first sight. Because real love is actually service. There are people that say, oh, oh, I, you can, I, I love two women. That's not love. You are attracted to two women. When it's attraction, you can be attracted to many women. In fact, Solomon was attracted to 1,000 women. 
There's no limit to how many people you can be attracted to, but there's a limit to how many people you can be committed to. Oh, somebody didn't get that. I said there's no limit to how many people you can be attracted to, but there's a limit to how many people you can be what? Committed to. Because commitment by its nature involves loyalty. You can be attracted to many ministries, but you can only be committed to one church. I don't know if you're going to what I'm saying. You can be attracted to anybody. So when you say, oh, I love more than one person. No, you don't love more than one person. You just have an emotional issue. You, have, you, you lack self-control. Because real love involves loyalty. Involves commitment. You don't cheat because you love more than one person. You cheat because you don't have self-control. Because you will always see people you are attracted to throughout your lifetime. Yeah, you marry somebody doesn't mean you won't see other fine people. Doesn't mean you won't see other rich people. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You will see other rich people, you see other fine people, you see other and gifted people. But real love involves loyalty. Please get this book, Come on, Love Lies. I dealt with, there are many love lies you have believed that might be stopping you. I asked my mom, how did you meet my dad? She, said she, she was just in her house, her fellowship leader, elder, uh, an elderly man, came to her house with my dad. And say, Sister Rosa, this man is from Lagos. He wants to marry you. What do you say? And I asked her, what do you say? She said, she looked at him and said, hmm, he's okay. <laughs> she said, yes. They were married. That's why in those days, you hardly see people, people stay single for long. Because they understood that you love after. We were all looking for love before. Um, and the issue is that what we don't realize is that our emotions are tied to our thoughts. So the things you find attractive is based on what you have fed your mind. If you have watched movies, 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 the picture of love for you is different from the reality of what love is. Your mind is like a computer. It's garbage in, garbage out. It's whatever you have fed it that it is operating by. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. Please, everybody, get this book. I don't want to waste time on this. Come on, love lies, please. So, let's go into how you prepare. Number one, prepare spiritually. I've said that in finding your habits, service is a major thing. If you're in a church like this, I hope you serve in a unit. All the young people upstairs, hope you serve in a unit. Just because you're in school, is not an excuse not to serve. Serve even in your campus fellowship or whatever it is. Serve in church. Serve somewhere. Every single person will be serving because service is number one thing that prepares you for marriage. Marriage has been easy for me because I was serving thousands of people before I got married. So, serving one person was not hard. I was serving thousands of people. The word minister is the word servant. So I've been a minister almost all my life. So serving one person, easy. I don't even need energy for that. Because I've been serving thousands without even a thank you. And if you get what I'm saying, serve. Serve. So let's go into how you prepare. Number one, spiritually. Seven areas every human being must develop. I will not, obviously not be able to finish the seven. Wherever I stop, it's, we'll continue when I come next year. <laughs> or whenever I come. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. How do you prepare? Number one, spiritually. Prepare spiritually. Your spiritual preparation. Spiritual life. Bishop, sir, you know everything the Bible has asked us to do in marriage is what they have asked us to do as Christians. Everything. So it's, it's an abnormally when a Christian's marriage fails. Then we should question your Christianity. Because everything you are asked to do in marriage is what we are asked to do as a Christian. For instance, in marriage, you are asked to forgive. Well, as a Christian, you've been asking us to forgive. If I've been practicing forgiveness as a single, it will be easy to forgive your spouse. When I say married person, say, I can never forgive. It's hard to forgive. You know they've not been practicing. They've been keeping malice with people when they were single. Marriage doesn't change you. It only amplifies you. When you say, I do on the altar, nothing about you changes. So every, they told us to forgive when we are single. It's the same thing you do in marriage, forgive. They told us to be tolerant when we are single. It's the same thing you do in marriage, you're tolerant. But many people have not done it as singles, as Christians, so they are finding how to do it in marriage. It's the same thing. I remember somebody called their bishop one day and said, Bishop, I'm tired of my wife. I can't stay in this marriage anymore. And the man of God told him, Brother, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wife. He said, She's not my wife. She has been staying in the next room for months. We're not in the same room for months. He said, the Bible said, love your neighbor. 
He said, she's not my neighbor. She has been insulting me every day. Insulting me every day. He said, the Bible said, love your enemy. <laughs> you see, everything is there. You have not just been applying it when you were single. You thought once you marry, you will apply your spirituality. No, no, no. You practice when you are single. Serving people, loving people, forgiving people, being tolerant of other people, appreciating other people, being considerate of other people about their feelings. You know that people that say me, I just say my mind. If every time you say your mind, you hurt somebody, that's the wrong way to say your mind. Because some people brag about it. I say, you know me, I always say it as it is. No, it just shows you have no decorum. You have no sense of perception. You are, you are not emotionally intelligent. That's what it means. If every time you say your mind, somebody's hot. It's not a thing to be proud about. Are you here, somebody? Spiritual preparation. Do you pray? Because in marriage, you will need prayer. There are many marriages that won't survive without prayer. A wise man said, <laughs> if you marry right, you get a prayer partner. If you marry wrong, you get a prayer point. <laughs> if you marry right, you get a prayer partner. If you marry wrong, you get a prayer point. I woke up this morning to my wife praying. Hallelujah. <laughs> she was at the balcony praying, and that's what I woke up hearing. It was so sweet. Prayer sets the mood. We fall in love to whom we pray, with whom we pray, and for whom we pray. If you always pray for your partner, you will love them. If you always pray with your partner, you will love them. There are many of you here, you don't even know me. I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray for my partner. I told you yesterday, we have a book, Praying for Your Husband, Praying for Your Wife. So if a man, because there are many men that don't, they don't, men don't want to do anything for their family. They just want to think of business or money. Listen to me. One of the cheapest ways to prosper financially is to love your wife. First Peter 3, 7. He said, deal with your wife according to knowledge or else your prayers will be hindered. One of the ways to accelerate your financial success as a man is to learn how to treat your wife. And one of the things a woman loves the most is a praying husband. And if you don't know what to pray, I've written out the scriptures and the prayer points. Pray them over your wife. Same thing for you as a wife. Pray them over your husband. There are two good books. Very simple, easy to read. Prayer points you can pray over your spouse. Women, I told you yesterday, women are first emotional, secondly spiritual. Women are spiritual natural. That means, that's why if they don't know God, you will still see them in prayer houses and with, with uh, witch doctors. Women are spiritual. They will look for spiritual um, nourishment one way or another. They will follow someone online. They will do, women are spiritual. And you as a man, if you don't feel that need, you are leaving that vacuum for somebody else to fill. So you don't have to be a spiritual giant. The materials are here now, but you won't buy them. You're just walking straight. <laughs> if you leave the family Sabbath conference, the same man you were when you started, then something is wrong with you. Put in the effort. It's not hard. Put in the effort. It will make sense. At the end of the day, you will not be remembered for how much money you made. You'll be remembered for how much impact you made in your family. Most men don't realize that. You think the world will remember uh, all the things you did financially and your company? Nobody remember that. It's your family. The real thing that matters is not what you live for your family. It's what you live in your family. It's not what you live for them. It's what you live in them. That's what the real legacy is. Please, all the men, get praying for your wife. There are prayers you should pray over your wife. And I've, I've mentioned this book, How to Make Love to a Woman Without Touching Her. Very important for men. Please, all the men. Don't be too business. I had one of my sons in the Lord who was a millionaire, one of the first millionaires that were raised in our ministry. This guy was so blessed. Be a millionaire, traveling around the world, even when we were all kids. He was traveling around the world, millionaire. And he always say, Pastor, whenever you're preaching about money, that's when you should call me. When you teach your marriage, I'm not interested. And truly, all my teachings on prosperity prospered him. He became very rich, but he never attended the marriage seminars. He was not interested. He had two bad marriages before he died. He died young. Very young, very, very young. Died in his 30s. Was a millionaire from his 20s. Died in his 30s. Two failed marriages. Because he was clearly not interested in anything about marriage. Just tell me about money. You don't, so men don't even know why they're making money. It's I'm making money for the family. If you lose the family while you're making money, then you, are not, you don't know why you're making money. You won't lose the family because you're making money. So you've not bought any book on marriage. But you're still looking for more financial books. 
the quickest way to prosper is to treat your wife well. Are you here, somebody? Spiritual development. I have to rush. Second one is emotional development. Again, learn about how love works. Become emotionally intelligent. Become considerate of other people. Learn how to talk. Learn how your wife talks. Learn how your husband talks. I shared a lot about that dif the differences yesterday. Learn emotional management. It's not when, when you are still emotionally immature, you say everything the, the, the moment you feel it. But the Bible said the wise person keeps something later. If you're able to manage your emotions and not pour out all your body at the same time, you're able to manage and, and, and focus on the timing. Emotional maturity. Just because you are hot doesn't mean you should pour out the whole thing today. Many women struggle with communicating with men because they don't understand that men are more bothered about how you say what you say than what you say. So you're upset and you want to just dish everything out. The way it's doing you in your body now, it's just, it's just doing me now, I must talk. No, you must not. You must develop emotional maturity. Build your emotions. Build it. Hallelujah. Learn how to, how to, how to manage how you feel. You can't fall in love every week. Some single people, they fall in love every week. I don't know if you've met those people. Every week, they have a new heart drop. Some people are even in a relationship with somebody that doesn't know them. <laughs> Number three, I'm trying to rush as much as I can. Number three, mental development. Mental what? Development. Hey, how many books have you read? What you don't realize is that one of the ways a marriage works is by you remaining attractive. And one of the things that make you attractive is building all the components of your life, not just one. What I discovered with many people is that they build only one aspect. There are some people that they are just spiritual. That's all they have. Every day they read only Bible. That's all. They don't read anything except Bible. Well, that's fine. You'll be very spiritually mature. It's just that you'll be out of touch. Because even the very Bible says, when you marry, you will care for the things of the world. That's what the Bible says. You do, but you don't read that part. He said, when you're married, you will not care for the things of the world. So you, know, but you don't care about this world. This world is not my own. But Jesus attended weddings. Jesus sat at dinner with people that were not even Christians. He could have normal conversations. You must develop yourself mentally. You must be in touch. Don't just focus on one area. Sometimes two ladies focus on only one area. They don't develop mentally. They don't realize that the things that attract you to a man is different from the thing that will keep the man. Your shape can attract a man, but it takes being sharp to keep a man. This is why many people, when, 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 when the man was chasing you, you were all in all. The moment you started a relationship or started a marriage, he can't have a conversation with you because you don't know anything. Other than where they make nails <laughs> and where they sew dresses. That's all you have concern about fashion. When I look at the lady's page and all you post is your picture. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> Throughout. That's all going on in your life. You and how you look. You will bore a man. At the beginning, he could be attracted to that. But once you agree, men are project driven. Once they've hit the project, you need something higher to keep them interested. So you must build your mental side. Can you have conversation about politics? Can you have conversation about sports? Can you have conversation about travel? Can you have conversation about, about other things? Except just beauty. Or Z World. Or Indian movies. <laughs> or Korean movies. I don't know if you watch just those things here. Amen. Build yourself. Mentally. Can you have other conversations with you? It takes me, my Professor Emeritus, I told you yesterday about my, one of my mentors and marriage coaches, Professor Emeritus Solomon David. He said something on that very powerful theory. He said, a beautiful woman, a beautiful face on an empty head is like putting a gold ring on a pig's snout. Did you hear that? He said, a beautiful face on an empty head it's like putting a gold drink on a pig's snout. How did Solomon know that? Because in his 1,000 women, he had some girls that were very pretty, and that's all. They didn't know anything. You can't have a conversation with them about anything. Just, ah, 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 ah. Look. 
if you're a pretty lady here, and most of you here are pretty, resist the temptation to only focus on your looks. Because human nature is whatever people praise you about, you focus on it. If we tell every day you're pretty, you're beautiful, you say, oh, thank you, thank you, and you focus on that all your life, you, you don't read. That's why you see those girls that are trying to deceive men online, they always post their body because that's all they have. You notice they don't post their mind. <laughs> because they are, put, they are putting their best foot forward. That's all they have. No intellectualism, no mental development. Build your mind. Learn things about, learn something about everything. Be able to have a conversation with even the president and let it be interesting. Men are always outstanded by intelligent women. They can be attracted to the sexy woman. But you see, after some point, there has to be more to you than your looks. Hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have a book there titled, When Am I Ready? We dealt with um, how to prepare yourself for marriage. So please, everybody get that book, When Am I Ready? Because people ask me that all the time. Pastor, how do I know I'm ready for marriage? Great. I answered that question in that book. Hallelujah. If you're a lady, you also get the book titled Manual. That will help you know how men think. You need to know what men mean when they say certain things. Then I have another one there titled How to Know, whether, how to know If He Loves He or She Loves You. Very important. Too many people have been deceived. Because somebody said, I love you. And you just think, oh, I love you too. <laughs> and the good thing is that it's two books in one how to know if um, he loves you how to know if she loves you they're the same book they're, they're the same book but two different sides so you're buying two books for one if you're a guy you focus on how to know if she loves you because women also deceive men people don't know <laughs> a lot of times women have more than one option yeah so there's a way to know if you are an option if you, or if you are the real person mm, there are codes women give when they are, they are talking to three or four people and they are waiting for the highest bidder. <laughs> so if you're a man, don't, don't fall into that danger. Get that book, How to Know If She Loves You. But the same book also answers How to Know If He Really Loves You. Because there are some men too that are deceivers. They'll keep deceiving you. All his friends will be calling you our wife. <laughs> our wife, if you are feeling happy. Those is useless friends. They have three other girls, they are telling the same thing. And you are cooking and bringing for them, they are all eating and calling our wife. And they know it's not you that he wants to marry. That book will expose that. And lastly, the thing, because of my time, preparation, prepare financially. Prepare what? Financially. Listen, scientists have found out, data people have found out, money is one of the things that breaks marriages the most, money. Because generally, human beings are sensitive about money. In fact, money is the only thing that Jesus compared with God. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Money is, money is powerful. He said, money answers all things. Money is the, one of the biggest threats. Many people will risk their life and save their money. You heard of the popular footballer case story, right? Of the guy that said he was hiding his money with his mouth. I don't even know the details of the story, but the point is that many people feel, I can keep my money safe and put my life in the hand of somebody else and put my kids in the hand of somebody else. But my money has to be preserved. That shows how people think. Money is a very sensitive topic. And before you marry, you need to know your own financial habits and the financial mindset of your partner or intending partner. Hmm. Finances can crack a home. Finances can break a home. Please don't play with money. Money is the thing that must attend all meetings that you have in your family. If you want to plan where we are going to live, after you and your spouse have discussed, one more person must approve. That's money. If money doesn't agree, that discussion is wasted. <laughs> when are we getting married? When is the wedding? You can fix your date. Your spouse can say their date. Even your in-laws can say their date. One, there's one person that must still agree. His name is what? Money. If he doesn't agree, that, date, that meeting is wasted. So you need to understand financial intelligence. In preparing for marriage, don't only read marriage books. Read financial books. Because your financial habits are important. I and my wife did a devotional titled No Dry Season. We married as a very broke couple. We married as a very broke couple. <laughs> we were very broke. 
Hallelujah. We were very broke. We saw, we saw poverty. We saw poverty. But the good thing was that our foundation was solid. We, we never depended on each other. I didn't see my wife as my source. She didn't see me as our source. We saw God as our source. So if you're a couple or intending couple, this is a devotional, 31 days devotional, no dry season, it deals with finances. So that both of you can be on the same page financially. People still say things like, uh, my money is my money, but your money is our money. You need to be on the same page financially. There are many people who've counseled, Dr. Kwame, there are many people who've counseled, that it's, it's, it's in counseling that they know what each other earn. They've not discussed money before. Some is in front of the bank. They wanted to take a loan. That's when they, they both heard for the first time. This is people that are married. They both heard for the first time what they both earn. Please, every couple, get no dry season. It helps you and your partner be on the same page. And ladies, there's a book here titled Seven Things I Badly Want to Tell Women. If a woman must get it. The forward was done by the richest black woman in Africa, Florence Shalakija. She's a minister of the gospel and the richest black woman in Africa. She's a billionaire in dollars. Because women have been raised over the years to think that they can't make money. They should always depend on men to pay their bills. Those days have passed. Men need to adjust. Women also need to adjust. Are you here, somebody? I know before now, most men have found their identity because they are the sole provider. You need to understand that that's a cultural mindset. It's not necessarily a scriptural mindset. I don't have time to go into that. But there's nowhere in the Bible, actually, the Bible says the man is a sole provider. It's not in the Bible. It's, it was started by culture because men of those days needed to be sure they can control women. Women can be hard to control by nature. Actually, they're not hard to control. It's just that the way you want to control them is the wrong way. That's why I did the book, How to Make Love to a Woman. You control a woman emotionally. You don't control her by force. You can't control her by force. She's an atomic bomb. <laughs> women have removed presidents that an army could not remove. So if you don't know what a woman is, you are joking. A woman is a powerful being. She can multiply your success or multiply your failure. That's what the Bible says. He that finds a wife finds a good and obtains favor. A woman can multiply your life. That's what the Bible says. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband's head. If you know how to manage a woman, you will succeed cheaply. Women are easy. Women are not hard at all. You just want to know how to speak their language. But you see, most men are too rigid. You don't want to learn. I must say it the way I want to say it. No, you must. If I come to Kenya, I need to learn. If I want to communicate with some people, I need to learn the language. I can't insist on speaking my language. Then I won't be a good communicator. I won't get the results I desire. I don't know if you guess what I'm saying. So women are not really hard. You just have to know how to communicate with them emotionally. That's why I did this book, How to Make Love to a Woman. But some men are not reading. Just, I just want to talk to her about like, look, those days are passing where you control a woman just because of money. Women are getting, they, they, most of us are raising our daughters to be doctors, to be lawyers. So the man they are going to marry is not going to control them with money. Because she's a doctor, she's a lawyer, she's educated, she can earn money. In fact, sometimes she can earn more than you, the man. So if we're teaching men that your sole job is to provide, that's the only way you get authority, you're going to lose. The battle's already lost. Because the ladies we're raising now are more educated than even the men. So if men don't adjust their thinking to biblical thinking, it was cultural. Those days, men ruled because they were the main providers. And that was fine, but it's no more sufficient today. Biblically. There's no way the Bible says the man should be the main provider. The scripture people use most times, First Peter, First Timothy 5, 8, he does not provide for his house. But I know you're a Bible church. Try and read the whole chapter. That scripture has nothing to do with marriage. That scripture was talking about widows. Verse 16 expounds the same verse 8. It says, if any man or woman does not take care of his own. They were referring to widows. They had a widow crisis in the church then. Many widows didn't have who to take care of them. And the church was paying all the bills. And Paul said, you know what? Those of you that, are, that have widows as your relative, you take care of them. And let the church take care of those that are widows indeed. Read the whole chapter, you will understand. And Proverbs 31 shows us women that were shaking things financially. That woman, that woman had about seven businesses. She was an importer, exporter, textile, different, um, real estate, a woman. And she said her husband was happy with her. Their marriage was still good, even though she was earning money. Some of you are stifling your wife. Your wife has potential to enrich your lineage. But they've told you that you must be the biggest earner. So you are stepping on her to make sure your own local championship <laughs> is maintained. I pray for you this morning in the name of Jesus that all the men in the house, God will give you grace 
to be the man after God's heart, to be a man that will lead the way God wants you to lead. You'll be a man that will cultivate your wife and your children. They too will become the best versions of themselves in the name of Jesus. And I pray for all the women in the house. You'll be a wife and not a knife. You'll be a help meet to your husband. You'll be a crown to your husband's head. And I pray for the singles that are in the house. I pray that you will attract the right partners. God will do a quick work in your life. I break the power of delay over you. You will not be unhappy while you are waiting. You will maximize your single years. God will prepare you for that man or that woman that he has kept for you. And I pray that your steps will be ordered of the Lord. And you will meet them even in this season. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If we are blessed, let's give the Lord a big hand. Amen.